Our reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, What should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasure for themselves but are not rich toward God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. I forgot last time to get a standout. I prefer to preach this way in here where I'm with you more. So, today is our second Sunday to share our stewardship campaign. It's titled, If Only. Last week we discussed, If Only I Had More Fulfillment. And that is a great foundation for us to now talk about, If Only I Had More Money, which is today's topic. We learned last Sunday that our fulfillment is to be in Christ. Following the rules and all of the commandments of God is a very good thing. But we must also be willing to give our heart to Jesus Christ in order to find true joy and fulfillment. And yet, wouldn't it be really nice to have this farmer's problems today? Wouldn't it be nice to have too much produce and too much grain to even know what to do with all of it? Or, for those of us who are not farmers, let's look at it this way. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have our salary doubled? That is if you're not a volunteer. We tease about that all the time. Have your salary doubled or your school loan debt retired? Or what about your house note forgiven? Sounds like hitting the inveritable jackpot or lottery. Well, but then we too could sit around and ask the same type of questions that this farmer is asking of himself. But instead of us asking, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops, our question might be, what should I do now, for I have all this extra windfall at the end of each month. Can you imagine? Let's take that one more step. Can you imagine if that extra windfall was the combination of a double salary, no car note, your house is paid off, and your student loan debt is forgiven? Then we could really sit around and ask, what should I do now? For I have more money than I could possibly spend. Now that would be a terrific problem to have. And what our scripture addresses today is how we answer that kind of very question. With what little we might have or what great amounts we might have. How we live it out, great or small, is the crux of the if only conundrum today. The real question becomes, on what or with whom will I choose to share my wealth, great or small? Unfortunately, what we see in today's scripture is a parable of a man who decided to spend it all on himself, save it all for himself, only worry about storing it up for himself. Jesus usually used an extreme example like this to teach us a point. Today, Jesus uses the extreme example and wealth of this farmer to help us put our money in perspective in our lives. 
You might have heard of the comedian Jack Benny from TV's Golden Ages. He had a skit which illustrated how we place money ahead of everything. You see, one day he was walking down the street when suddenly he approached, was approached by an armed robber. Your money or your life, is what he said. There was this long pause. Jack does nothing. The robber impatiently queried, well? To which Jack replied, don't rush me. I'm thinking it over. Now, theologically speaking, the rich farmer's self-centered, non-sharing attitude goes to the heart of this very scripture. You've heard me say that my guiding scripture, in short, has become love God and love neighbor. This is the short version from the verses that come from Matthew when the lawyer asked Jesus, Teacher, which commandment is the greatest? Jesus answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the greatest in first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Again, this is the opposite of self-centered and non-sharing. So taking our theology one step further, in John chapter 13, in Jesus' final hours on the last night with his disciples, he takes this very commandment and makes it even more pointed. For he says, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you, not as yourself. We now have the greatest and the newest commandment, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor, not as yourself, but as Jesus loved us. Love God and love neighbor. So seen through the eyes of the greatest and the newest commandments, we can look even deeper to see where our rich farmer has fallen short. Let's start with the newest commandment, love one another as I have loved you. Our rich farmer never seemed to even take into account any other person or neighbor when reflecting upon his great wealth. It seems as if he's completely forgotten that he lives, breathes, eats, and works in a community. And maybe, even more important, he does not seem to take into account the fact that it probably took a lot of others, a lot of neighbors, to make that bumper crop even happen. And yet there seems to be no mention of paying out bonuses to workers and managers, no mention of sharing with the local food bank or synagogue, no mention of selling some and giving 1%, let alone 10%, to God. It appears that in this extreme example from Jesus, our rich farmer has made his decision of what to do with his wealth in isolation. In isolation from the rest of the world. How lonely would that be? Our farmer has made his decision of how to proceed forward with his abundance apart from the consideration of any others. You see, God created us in God's image to be in community because God wanted companionship. God created us to be in community with God and with each other. Today's scripture is not just about money. Today's scripture is about consideration of the other. And this scripture is about consideration of the other when we have some money. How do we consider others with our money? How do we love one another as Jesus loves us with our money? How do we allow others to be priorities in our lives and not money? How is our faith reflected in the sharing of our money? Here are some fascinating financials. I know I've shared them before on John Wesley the founder of the Methodist movement. In his early to mid-twenties, he was a professor at Oxford in England, and his income was a whopping 30 pounds. Now, I don't know how much that means today, but let's break it out, and then it'll make sense. John lived off 28 pounds, 
and gave the other two away. Remember, this is his first full-time job, and note, he has not yet reached a 10% tithe. Here is what became his standard, though, for moving forward when his income increased to 60 pounds and 90 pounds and 120 pounds. John continued to live off of 28 pounds. And not only did he tithe, he gave all the rest, all the rest away. I could not find anything as to find where John Wesley saved any money for, you know, his um, mantra was earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. John Wesley made a lot of money in the 1700s. He was a very educated gentleman and wrote a lot of books in addition to leading the Methodist movement. Could you conceive? of continuing to live off your first full-time income decade after decade after decade and giving all the rest away like John Wesley. We were created to be in companionship and community with one another and to love one another as Jesus has loved us in all the ways that we live so that we do not live in isolation, and so that we do not live self-centered, non-sharing lives, and so that we truly find fulfillment in life as we encounter God in each other. And so speaking of God, the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. How in this farmer's actions has he shown love for God with any part of his being? He did not even consult God in the scripture, nor any other human in a community when it came time to figuring out what to do with this abundance. There was no brainstorming session, according to the scripture. In this extreme example from Jesus, our farmer never seemed to have an inclination to expand his world beyond himself on earth let alone to the God who created us and cares for us and lives with and in us. Can you imagine a life without consulting God, without having a relationship with God? God through Christ is the fulfillment of our lives as we build a relationship with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And as we build this relationship, we find our priorities in life begin aligning with God's will and those for whom we are in community, and our neighbors around us as well. This solid foundation of relationship is our fulfillment. We have seen this lived out in others' lives or our own, especially when tragedy strikes. All of a sudden, our priorities shift, and we realize that the most important things in our life are not things we realize that the most important things in our lives become God and those around us in community. Sometimes that wake-up call is a near accident or a natural disaster. Other times the wake-up call is related to our health or our finances. The wake-up call, the wake-up happens when we realize that it is God that truly needs to be our foundation. And the people in our lives are who we need to be giving our attention and our heart and our time. Corey Ten Boom, a Holocaust, sur Holocaust survivor, has been quoted as saying, Never be afraid to trust your unknown future to a known God. With God on our side, our lives are fulfilled. With God on our side, we can walk into an unknown future unafraid. Or at least not as afraid and with the knowledge of knowing we are not walking alone. So back to the Jack Benny quote. Your money or your life. God is not asking us to make a choice. What God is asking us to do is be responsible 
with our financial gifts through loving a very known God and loving our neighbor as Jesus has loved us. That is where we find fulfillment in life. Amen and amen.